Herlish Willkommen und guten Tag. Welcome to the Car and Bike Show. I am Siddharth Vinayak Patankar. We are back in Germany and the reason I'm here is quite evident. You can see it right around me. I'm at the Kunden Center, the customer center at Sindelfingen, which is the heart of manufacturing for Mercedes-Benz worldwide. This is a significant site because this car, the flagship, the EQS, rolls out from a plant not too far from where I'm standing, Factory 56 the most advanced manufacturing facility for Mercedes-Benz worldwide. Now, the car has been confirmed for India, you know this. It's also 2022 World Luxury Car winner, you know this too. And I have been driving it now for a couple of days. So I thought today on the show, I wanted to give you a little bit of a glimpse of this car. So lots to expect from it because of course, it is the most advanced product. So it's the flagship from Mercedes. But even in terms of its electric credentials, According to the WLTP figures, it gives you way over 700 kilometers of driving range. So even in an Indian context, in a real world sense, this will be the car with the highest range available when it launches. All electric. Remember, Mercedes will have this and the EQB driving in this year. And uh, we thought it was fitting to bring you this news from right here in Sindelfingen. So that is your first glimpse of the all new Mercedes-Benz EQS. This is the 580, which is the range topping model. It's also the one we will be getting many more details. And of course, the review is something you'll have from me on the show in very, very quick time. Right now, let's get on to our top story. It's a car that is very popular, huge in terms of volumes. And so you definitely want to see the review of its second generation. I'm talking about the Brezza, no longer Vitara Brezza. It is the car that you've been waiting for. And here is our full review. The Brezza's exterior design is much more urbane, progressive than before. It is still rugged no doubt, but adds a tinge of class to it now. Let's start with the face of the car. The grille is now wider than before and the gunmetal finish that you get around it looks very imposing. There's also decent amount of chrome thrown around it. The wide but flat bonnet gives it a very upright stance, which is all a giveaway for a proper SUV. Lower down, you get these redesigned bumpers. You also get these silver skid plates, which also adds to its rugged appeal. The headlamps are dual LED projector lamps, which are nicely stacked. And you also get LED treatment for the DRLs. Lower down, you get these LED fog lamps, which are nicely nestled, but both the LED treatment to the fog lamps and the DRLs are only optional for the higher spec variants. Now moving to the profile of the car, the silhouette is pretty much the same as the previous car. You get these squarish wheel arches that are more in size, there's more area that has been occupied, but that also adds to that rugged appeal. The cladding that we found on the front is also retained in the side and this also adds to that SUV appeal, that rugged do-it-all appeal. The 16-inch wheels are the same, but you get a new dual-tone treatment to these alloys, which looks very sporty. But apart from that, the dimensions, the proportions are pretty much the same. Now, looks are subjective, of course, but I've kind of started liking how the rear section of the Brezza looks. In fact, most of the car makers in this space have gone for that quirky, trendy-looking rear section that goes beyond the C-pillar. So you get these nice, clean-looking LED tail lamps with a gloss black finish, but this is only restricted to the higher trims. You get these huge Brezza lettering, but the font is actually good. It's a nice touch, and I really like that fact. You also get this 360 degree camera over here that displays your parking sensors, what you see in the display inside the car. The smart hybrid badge over here denotes to the part petrol, part electric motor. Lower down, you get these black laddings and the silver skid plates, all adding to that rugged appeal that you can see all around the car. Overall, the design is distinct, 
looks contemporary and certainly stands out in a crowd of SUVs. The dashboard design is completely new and the car now comes with a dual tone black and brown scheme. Lower trims though get an all black theme. The steering wheel, instrument cluster and a 9 inch smart play pro plus touchscreen infotainment system are new and remind you of the Baleno's cabin and are pretty much the same in functionality. The Brezza is also now more tech laden than before. The top spec variants get Suzuki connected car tech with more than 40 features, while music is now handled by Archimus sound system. The electric sunroof is a welcome addition, a little too late maybe. A 360 degree camera, wireless charging and a heads up display are all part of the top spec trims. The Brezza is now powered by an improved version of the 1.5 litre K series dual jet petrol engine coupled to a smart hybrid motor. This unit generates 103 brake horsepower at 6000 rpm and 137 Nm of peak torque at 4400 rpm, paired to a 5 speed manual gearbox and a new 6 speed torque converter. We had both the versions on test with us, but it was the automatic that I had my eyes on. Now the biggest issue that I had with the 4-speed torque converter in the older Brezza was the fact that it lacked that initial punch. It wasn't very rev happy and the slow shift made that drive extremely dull. That is sort of now sorted with this 6-speed uh, torque converter with paddle shifters. I say sort of because it is still hesitant for a quicker throttle response. So if you want to overtake, it does take some time to get in sync with the engine with the power that is cool. The Brezza still aces on the city front. It rides smoothly and offers a nice and comfortable experience for the passengers. The low end torque is ample to navigate in the city but things are slightly different on open roads. In city driving it is perfectly fine. It drives very decently, it's very comfortable, the NVH levels are quite refined and you, the cabin noise is extremely low. But on the highways, the gear spread takes a bit of time because it does not have that refinement, it lacks that finesse that you would probably need from a new gearbox. We have seen this also on the XL6, we face the same issues, it did not have that exact urgency that you would need on a highway for a pleasurable drive. But then again, as most Maruti cars, these are tuned for comfortable, more fuel efficient drive. So that's probably why if you want something sporty, it still does not match. I then switched to the manual version. Power delivery is linear and quite free flowing beyond the 2200 RPM mark. Gear shifts aren't exactly crisp but maintain a nice refinement. I was mighty impressed with the suspension setup on both the cars in fact. The car managed to gobble down broken roads with ease at speeds between 60 to 90 kmph quite comfortably. Body roll is still there but not as much as before. Overall, the driving dynamics have improved. Not substantially though, but won't upset you on daily commute or even on longer journeys. The 2022 Brezza is now smarter than before thanks to more than 40 connected car features. There's no wireless Android Auto or Apple CarPlay but instead is wired. But you would be pleased to know that charging can now be done without a cable. But these features are limited to only the higher spec models. 6 airbags, reverse parking sensors, isofix child anchorage are all part of the ZXi plus trim only and so are the tilt and telescopic steering. The Brezza is now expensive than before. Its starting price of 7,99,000 rupees is at a premium over its closest rivals. 
both the Hyundai Venue and the Tata Nexon by almost 50,000 rupees, while both these cars offer diesel options as well. With the 2022 update, Maruti has managed to do away with plenty issues in the car. It is feature rich now, gets a whole bunch of connected car tech, a sunroof, heads up display, and of course, the new engine gearbox combo. Seems like it could be an instant hit. The design is trendy, but would be interesting to see its presence on road once the sales get going. BMW has shocked and surprised by bringing in the i4 all-electric performance sedan to India at a price below 70 lakh rupees. But is the headline the price or the fact that this is a true BMW performer? So let's get a sense of perspective in terms of where this car is positioned. Now in size terms, it's exactly like a 3 Series. It is, of course, a four-door sedan. We're not getting a coupe on this, thank God. But the point I'm trying to make is that in positioning terms, it becomes a little difficult to understand because while, yes, size-wise, it's like a three-series sedan, in terms of price positioning, it's closer to what a five-series sedan looks like, right? But it has a different sense of performance being all electric, and there, it's almost like an M3. A quick look at the iPhone's design, which may or may not be polarizing. So the current generation of the 4 Series and also the new M3 and M4, they preceded this car by several months. The good part about that is we all got used to this. It kind of grew on us, literally, this giant face with that huge kidney grill. Now, you know, some people love it, some hate it, but that debate has now died. It is what it is, you've got used to it. I think that helps the i4 because, frankly, it looks pretty good. The use of the blacked out portion also looks nice. It's a signature of the BMW i brand. And you don't need to really have a grill, right? It's an electric. It doesn't need that to be a functional grill. So it is just about a visual identity of the BMW brand. And somehow it adds to the sportiness and to the aggressive character of this car. The bits I really like, which have been carried over in a sense from the 4 Series or from the M4, the very muscular very powerful looking hood and of course the rear end which is absolutely gorgeous. Big thumbs up to BMW to go smart with the design touches especially at the rear to give an impressive first look. Not to mention that the designers didn't go too wild with the styling either and the car exudes a very obvious performance character through its muscle. So unlike the iX, the i4 is relatively subtle and more in line with the current portfolio and its performance attribute. No gimmicks either, like for instance the door handles aren't retractable but nicely integrated anyway. I also like the lift back design for the tailgate to pop open, it's almost spaceship like. The 471 litre boot is spacious and practical and then you get the 40-20-40 split on the rear seat to accommodate more cargo. It's after a long time that I have this stupid grin on my face as I'm driving because it's really surprising what the car will do dynamically. It is absolutely effortless. Its handling is absolutely sublime. I think that's the part that I'm clearly enjoying. So this car is fast, it's so quick, it's so responsive. The mind boggles with what could possibly come when the MGMBH guys bring us their born electric models. Now that's going to be something absolutely ridiculous. Now every BMW promises 
dynamic performance. So that's like at the core of its development, thank God. And with this car, the expectations were that it would take it to the next level for a couple of reasons, right? I mean, electrics, they're quick, you get lots of torque. And then, you know, it's supposed to be based off of the 4 Series, but more akin to the M4 kind of performance. You hear all this, you come in, you have great expectations. The i4 beats those expectations and beats them by a mile. If and when you get past the sheer performance attribute of this car, well, that's when you'll start thinking of other things which are really nice too. Ergonomics, the big giant screen, and all the functions. But as all low-slung sports sedans go, the i4 also has its Achilles heel. Well, sort of. In many places in our country, there isn't consistency when it comes to the size, shape, and type of speed breaker that you might have to go over. So that's where you do need to be a little bit careful because there are certain bumps that will hit the bottom of the car. It's not dangerous per se, but it's still something to watch out for. At the start of this review, I showed you how the i4 is essentially an electric car in the guise of the BMW 3 Series. And since I had that other car with me, I thought, well, I should actually just try them both out together. So I quickly hopped into it after having spent some time with the i4 on the road. Now, one thing I knew before I got into a 3 Series after having driven the i4, I knew it would feel slower. I knew that the response and just that instant takeoff, they're going to be very different. The part that's actually surprised me and completely blown me away is just how much better even the handling is on the i4. The i4 is from a different planet altogether. Its handling is precise, almost excellent. The steering is just sublime and the lower center of gravity than on the BMW 330i or Li, even the M Sport, only adds a whole new driving experience. The longer roof line adds to the rear seat roominess and I'll get to that part in a second, but the large proportions are not a deal breaker either. And the car gets a fairly generous wheelbase. Now there's one thing that's gonna tempt you with the newer and even older BMW models to a certain extent, and that's the interior. Off late, we've really seen BMW turn around its design on the cabin. There's still lots of very functional, important buttons, but for the most part, you get a very slick looking cabin, especially on the i4, which has the new design language. The dashboard is largely dominated by the wide, curved, dual screen display that spans across the width behind the wheel, all the way to the center of the dash. The single display houses a 12.3-inch digital instrument cluster and a 14.9-inch central infotainment screen. It's got high-resolution graphics and they have ultra-quick response to touch. It takes some time to get used to, but the layout and the look is very sexy. The eighth generation of BMW's operating system is packed with connected features wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, also standard. The blue start button and blue circle surrounding the logo on the steering wheel, well, that's a nice little electric car and BMW i-brand touch. The generous use of synthetic and real leather upholstery options is available in a range of colors. Yes, more sustainable materials in the i4. The rear seats, not cramped for space, as I was saying earlier, and this is true even on long drives. It's pretty comfortable at the back. The 
BMW i4 is quite literally an electric 4 series grand coupe and so it doesn't have any of the wild new interior design features found on cars like the iX. Honestly, it just works better. The i4 is proof that the sports sedan formula can easily be translated into the EV space. But the fact that the car is based on an ICE platform doesn't really get in its way and yet maybe doesn't really explore the true potential of such a car. BMW has got all the right ingredients though. It's got the sexy low slung silhouette, lots of BMW spice in terms of dynamics and performance and sheer luxury. Overall, a good sticker price and a good electric sports sedan experience. Electric performance getting more and more exciting. Options in the electric market, even in India now, getting more and more exciting too. Please react to everything you've seen. Tell us what you'd like to see. And remember that there's lots you can expect from Mercedes-Benz and its EQ range in India. We'll have all of those details for you. And one little nugget that I shared with you earlier was that the EQB is confirmed as arriving this year. Well, guess what? We're also hopeful that you'll have the AMG version of this car, the EQS. That may also come in. So that's also some interesting news coming from Mercedes EQ. React to all of this. Please promise me you'll wear your seatbelts and join me on the show next week. Take care.